you would, take your Bibles and go ahead and open with me to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. So as we get started this morning, I realize that for many of you, you are really missing Pastor Jim's teaching, really missing it. In fact, just in all honesty, probably some of you are really disappointed that he is not with us here today. And uh, I just want to say, you know what? I totally get that. <laughs> I feel you. You know, I, I understand that. Um, by the way, I do want to say I, I heard from him. I, he sent me a message the other day, and he is just so broken that he can't be here, uh, just that he's not been able to be here. He misses our church terribly. He misses you guys terribly. And uh, if there was any way in the world that he could be here, he would be here. So just know that. But I, I believe that God is sovereign over all of these things. We don't understand them. I'm, you know, we're trying to figure out you know, why are these things happening, what's going on here. But God is in control, and, and I hope that you believe that and you know that. God is in control, and um, although Pastor Jim is not with us today, I do believe that God still desires to work in our midst. He still desires to speak to us through His Word. He still wants to encourage us. He still wants us to to see and hear and understand the truth and, and for him to communicate that. And so one more time, let's just go before the Lord and ask that during this time of Bible study, that that's exactly what would happen, that we would hear from God. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you, and now as we open your word, oh Lord, that's what we long for. We want to hear from you. Give us an understanding of what you would say to us today. Help us to hear you. Help us to hear you, and then, Lord, help us to apply that into our lives. And just asking that today, Lord, you would do a, a work deep in every heart here, every life here, those that are present in our, our building today, those that are watching online, those that will listen to a recording of this message at some point in the future. Lord, just praying and believing, Lord, that you want to meet us. You want to, to speak to us. You want to encourage us today. And so we pray that you would. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, most of you know that we have kind of a Bible reading plan that we follow along here at the church. We give out a bookmark like this every month, and it has daily Bible readings, uh, and we follow through those. Uh, some of you are doing it with us. Some of you are doing other plans. But um, I do this plan as well as some others, but uh, I, I do this plan, and back on Wednesday, December 9th, just last week, we were in Revelation chapter 2, the, the chapter we're going to be looking at today. You read it last week if you're following along in this plan. What's interesting about this uh, that, that uh, happened for me last week is while I'm reading along in this plan, uh, I kind of do my Bible study and with the church and go on to my uh, another plan, which by the way is very different. It had me in the exact same chapter, Revelation chapter 2. I don't recall that ever happening before. Uh, so, you know, kind of one of those interesting moments where it's, okay, Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? Do you have something for me here? And so, you know, I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper, spent some extra time just pouring over the text. And sure enough, there were just a number of things that God was putting his finger on in my life. And, and uh, so I believe that it's for me, but I would say I believe it's for our church. And I pray that it is a timely message that will impact all of us today. So that's how I arrived here in Revelation chapter 2. Before we dive into the text, I just want to give you just a tiny bit of background. We're in a section, chapters 2 and 3, that is called the Letters to the Seven Churches. Understand what this is. This is a section that Jesus is dictating seven letters to seven literal churches that were on the, on the earth at that time. He's dictating them to the church through, through John, and he's giving them an assessment of, of how they're doing. He's giving them condom, uh, commendations, not condemnations, commendations of, of the things that they're doing well. And he's then pointing out also the areas that they're not doing well. He's giving them a, a diagnosis for, for things that are amiss in the church and showing them how to correct that. And then with that, he's also giving them just a bit of revelation about himself to each church, to each letter. He, he tells them something uh, powerful about his character and his nature. So that's kind of the structure that follows all seven of these letters. We're only going to cover the first one. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, obviously you don't have the time to dive into that, into all of them, 
But Pastor Jim did a tremendous study in the book of Revelation. Some of you were here for that a couple of years ago. And I believe about two and a half years ago, he covered this very section. Uh, he went into a lot of the details about the structure of these letters, and there's just a lot of really cool technical things that I'm not even going to touch on today. Uh, so if you're curious, uh, if you want to know more, those uh, messages are on our website. You can download them. You can listen to the audio or the video, but they are there for you. So I just want to uh, encourage you to check those out if you're curious. Well, let's go ahead and let's just read through the letter, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Notice with me Revelation chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, And have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly. And remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this is a letter that Jesus communicated to the church in Ephesus, a literal church, kind of like we're meeting today. There was a group of believers meeting there in the city of Ephesus, and Jesus communicated what they needed to hear at their point in history. Now, imagine that, if you will, that you went to your mailbox and you opened the the door there and you pull out and you have a letter from Jesus. You know, I, I don't know how that would immediately strike you. It might be very fearful on one sense. It might be really exciting. You might be really joyful to hear from him. The point is, is that he wants to communicate. He wants to communicate to the church. And I believe that that's what he desires to do today. So notice the first thing in this letter, who it is addressed to. Look with me again at verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, Notice that this letter is addressed to an angel. Now, that's just an interesting thing right off the bat. Before we even get into the the real heart of this, we're confronted with something that's really confusing. What does this mean? Why is this church, uh, I'm sorry, this letter addressed to an angel? And I just want to take just a quick moment here and, and talk about two possibilities. Really, throughout church history, Bible scholars, theologians have really seen that there are really two possibilities here. One of them is that he's talking about an earthly messenger. In the Greek, the the term uh, for angel is angelos in the Greek, and it can simply be translated as messenger. And there are times in the Greek New Testament where this word is used in reference to a human messenger, a human being. So it could very well be that this is addressed to maybe the pastor of the church. Very likely that 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 could be the case. And in, in a sense, he's the messenger. He's receiving a message from God And he's communicating that. He's sharing that message then with his congregation, much like I'm desiring to do today. So it could be that this is addressed to the pastor of the church. However, others would say no. In the book of Revelation, every time the word angel is used, it's always talking about an angelic being from the supernatural realm. And... uh, there is some biblical basis for that. So there are others who would look at this and say, this is talking about a literal angel. Now, here's the deal. I'm not going to be able to solve this for you today. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I probably lean more towards the first explanation, but I don't know. But here's the point. The point is, is that although it's addressed to the angel of the church of Ephesus, it's for the congregation. In other words, it's for you today. It's for us. 
And what we will discover as we move through this is that what God is desiring to do is speak to individuals. Individuals make up the church. He's wanting to speak to us individually today. He has a message for you individually today. And that's what we don't want to miss. Well, the next thing that he does is he reveals something about his nature. He reveals something about his character. Again, this is Jesus writing here. Notice with me, pick it up uh, the middle of verse 1 there. He says, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So Jesus is speaking about himself, and he says that within his right hand, he's holding seven stars, and he's walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands. What in the world does he mean by this? What, what do these symbols mean? It's kind of a mystery. Well, thankfully, he tells us. So if you'll look at the, uh, the last verse of chapter 1, verse 20, it says this, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So he tells us what they are. He says, in my right hand, in my right hand I'm holding these seven stars. And here's what I want you to see. Is that the church, the church is being upheld by the by his strength, by his power. You'll notice there that he says it's his right hand. Now, this is not a slam to any of you South Paws, any of you lefties out there. Not a slam in in any way. But in the Bible, the right hand is typically denoted as the hand of strength. And that's kind of how he's trying to communicate it to us. That in my strong, righteous right hand, I am holding these seven stars. I am holding this thing together. What I want you to see is that Jesus, he is the head of his church He is the head of his church, he is involved in his church, and he is holding it together. Then he says that he's walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And he he tells us that the lampstands, they are the church. Here's what I want you to see. He's walking in the midst of his people. He's walking in the midst of his church. Right now, Jesus is among us. Right now, he's walking among us. And and there ought to be some... uh, some excitement about that there ought to be some sense of of even reverent fear that he is with us even right now we don't see him with our physical eyes but he is here with us kind of to summarize that thought he's involved jesus is the head of his church he hasn't just given it to an organization or denomination or a group of people uh, to be stewards over it while he goes away. And no, he says, I'm, I'm actually the one that's holding it together. I'm actually the one that's intricately involved in all, all that is going on here. And so it is, even here today. We don't see him with our physical eyes, but he is among us. He's with us. Emmanuel, we sing those uh, the, the Christmas songs, the, the, this time of year, Emmanuel. God with us is how it's translated. He is here among us, this abiding relationship that God has in the midst of his people. And I hope you understand what I mean when I, when I say church. I'm not talking about this structure. This building will fail. This building, as they say, is, it's all going to burn someday, right? We're not talking about the building. We're talking about the people of God. We're talking about the people who have been purchased and redeemed by his blood. That's you and that's me. We are the people of God. We're called out. We're set apart. And he's walking in the midst of his people. And he's involved in every aspect of the church. Well, we move to the next section. And this is the section of the letter where Jesus commends them for the things that they're doing right. He's going to talk to them about the things that are going on in the church of Ephesus, the things that are are going well for them. Notice with me there, it says in verse 2, he says, I know your works. Let me go ahead and just stop there for a moment. I know your works. Think about this for a moment. He knows us. He knows your works. There is nothing that you have ever done, nothing you could ever do that would escape his knowledge. There's nowhere you could go to hide from him. You can turn off the, turn off the light. You can, you can 
stumble around in the darkness as we sometimes do, but none of it escapes his attention. He knows us. He knows you. Now, in one sense, that might be really terrifying. <laughs> it might be kind of frightening to think that, you know, he knows what I'm thinking even right now. He knows all the struggles, all the temptations, all of those things. He's aware of them. And it might be a little disconcerting, but, but I want you to think about it differently. For the believer, for the believer, it's different because he knows us and he loves us. Here's what I want you to think about. We come into church today, and, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we come into church and we put on appearances. We put on a smile. You know, we, we greet people. How you do? Oh, I'm great. I'm doing great. When in reality, you're not doing so great, right? In reality, your life is kind of like a big hot mess inside, and you, you just don't want anybody to know that. And so we, we maintain or we seek to maintain appearances, you know, kind of like putting on a mask or whatever. And I want to tell you, that, that just doesn't work with God. He sees right through you. There is nothing that you can hide from Him. He knows what's going on. You might be able to fool some of the people around you. But that is exhausting to keep up appearances, is, is it not? That's exhausting to pretend to be something or to pretend, pretend to be uh, doing a certain way when it's just not true of you. How much more freeing is it to say, Lord, you know me. You know me warts and all. You see all my flaws. You see all of the things I struggle with. You see all of those thoughts going on in my head right now. You know everything I think before I ever think it. All that's going on in our lives. Isn't it freeing just to say, Lord, you see me. You know me. Because here's the deal. He sees all that stuff in your lives, all that stuff in my life, and he loves us. He loves us. He loves you. He sees all of that, that conflict within you, all of the struggle between the spirit and the flesh that we all wrestle with, and He loves you. You don't have to try to impress Him. You don't have to try to maintain some kind of um, appearance. You can just be you and just say, Lord, here I am, warts and all. He loves you. Now, that doesn't mean that He's not going to deal with some stuff. Because that's exactly what he's going to do with his church here. He's going to put his finger on some things and say, that right there, we need to work on that. But again, he brings those things out. He brings those things to our attention. Why? Because he loves us. So the way that I take this, it's a freeing thing. He knows you. There's nothing that you can hide from him. He knows you and he loves you. Well, let's continue on. He says, uh, verse 2 there, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Again, Jesus gives them a commendation here that really is amazing. This is a wonderful list. The things that are happening in this church, there are some great things happening. Let me kind of summarize it for you. The first thing that we see is that they are a laboring church. This is a busy church. These are not a, a group of people on the sidelines. They are plugged in. They are involved. They are serving. In fact, the word labor there literally means to toil. So they are a sacrificing church. They're pouring themselves out to serve God and serve each other. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. Not only that, but we notice that it, uh, he tells us there that um, you cannot bear those who are evil. The thought is simply this, that this is a church that is concerned about purity. They're concerned about holiness. They're concerned about living righteous lives before the Lord. And they're not going to allow that kind of loose living into the church. That's a good thing. It's a great thing to be concerned about holiness in your life. It's kind of almost become a negative thing in our culture, but that's a very good thing, and the Lord Jesus here says that's a good thing. Not only that, but they're concerned about truth. They're concerned about right doctrine. He says there that you, uh, uh, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So they are testing the things that they're hearing. 
When they see a group coming in with false doctrine, they're like, nope, not here. That's not going to happen here. We're going we're to test the things that you're preaching, the, the, the things that you're wanting to share. And, and they found them to be false. So this is a church that is concerned about truth, about good doctrine, about orthodoxy. And then fourthly, they're doing all of this for the Lord. Notice with me what it says there in the uh, middle of verse 3. It says, And have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. The things that they're doing, they are doing for Jesus. They're doing it for His name. It would seem that their, that their motives are right, it would seem. So here we have a list, again, that is just a glowing list. Here's what I want us to think about for a moment. These things ought to be targets for us. They ought to be targets for us as a church, as a corporate group of people, but also as individuals. Are we serving? Are we laboring? Are we toiling when needed? Are we giving of ourselves? Are we pouring ourselves out or are we on the sidelines? Are we concerned about personal holiness? Are we seeking to live lives that are, are honoring of the Lord? Are we putting aside sin in our lives? Or is that a struggle? Are we pursuing truth? Good doctrine? Is that even important to us? These are targets for us. And, and I can't answer this question for you in, in your life, but these are things that we want to aim at. I think in some of these areas, we might be hitting the mark. In some, maybe we're a little, uh, a little bit off. We're missing the mark in some of these areas, perhaps. But these are things that he's putting before us that he is saying, these are things that are important to me. That's what Jesus is communicating to us. These are targets for us that we ought to be seeking to hit in our lives. And again, I just want to ask the question, how are we doing? How are you doing with these things? Now, if you were visiting this church, if you're looking for a church and, and you, you come into a group of people like this, and you look around and you see, wow, they're, these people, they're on fire here, man. They're, they're, they're serving, they're, they're working, they're toiling, they're doing all this stuff. They're, they're pure, they're, they're teaching here is fabulous. You, know, you might think, this is a great church. This is a great church. If we just saw that part of it, we would think to ourselves, this is where I want to be planted. This is where I want to be. But I want you to notice something here. This church has a serious problem this church has a very very serious problem and that's what we're going to get into here this next section jesus is going to give them a diagnosis and reveal to them something that is a life-threatening condition in this church he's going to give them a diagnosis now some of you you're going through the same kind of thing right now in a physical sense my wife right now is kind of going through a situation in a physical sense Maybe your health is good right now, but you can point back to a time in your life when you kind of went through one of these seasons where something is wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm going to the doctor and they give me this battery of tests, you know, and they still don't know what's wrong. Have you ever been in that kind of spot? I know that there are some in our fellowship. It's a tough season right now. We've got just a number of folks in our fellowship who are just going through hard, hard things. But you're looking for this diagnosis and you go to the doctor and they give you this battery of tests and you've been poked and you've been prodded and scoped and scammed, uh, scanned and scraped. I mean, all this stuff going on and they still don't know what's wrong with you. They're like, well, we're ruling out some things, you know, and, but here's what I want you to see. Our modern medical science, as great as it is, Still, in many cases, it's just an educated guess. They're trying to figure out what's wrong with you, and it's like, ah, it might be this, it might be this, I don't know. But here's the point. Jesus gives a diagnosis, and he cuts right through all of it, and he sees clearly, and he puts his finger on it. He is the great physician of the soul. There's no second guessing here. And when Christ is looking at your heart, when he is gazing into your heart, it's not like he's wondering, hmm, something isn't right there, but I, I can't quite tell what it is. He knows exactly what is going on in each individual life and in every church. And he puts his finger on it here. And he gives this church a 
a diagnosis. Notice with me verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. In one simple sentence, Jesus tells them exactly what's wrong here. And He reveals to them a life-threatening condition. I have this against you. You have left your first love. Notice it does not say that you lost your first love. In other words, it was a choice or a series of choices. The church at Ephesus missed the main thing. They did a lot of great things, had a lot of activity, a lot of great stuff going on there, but they missed the most important thing. They left their first love. Now, when we talk about first love, I think you understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about first in terms of sequence. I'm talking about first in terms of priority. That the highest love that they are to have, that love for God, this all-encompassing love that they're to have for the Lord, they missed it. They left it. A series of choices, little decisions over time, they moved aside from it and missed the, the, the whole thing. They missed the, the main thing. I'll put up a couple scriptures here. Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment was, this is how He responded. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is the first commandment, He says. This is the first thing. The highest priority. There's nothing higher than this. And what God is calling us to and what He's longing for in our lives is that we would love Him with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, with our strength, with every aspect of our being. That we would have this, this love that rises above everything else. That He would be first in our lives. And for the Ephesian church, they missed this. They moved away from it. Here in Luke 14, this is an interesting verse. Luke 14, verse 26. Jesus speaking, He says, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be My disciple. This is a hard word right here. Now what is Jesus getting at? Is He saying, I, I literally want you to hate your family? <laughs> Guys, I want you to hate your wives. Is that what he's getting at? No. What he's trying to, to help us see is that our love for him, our devotion to him, must be far and above any other love in our lives. Obviously, God calls us to love our enemies. Husbands, he calls us to love our wives. We are called to be people who love everyone around us, right? We're called to express that and, and demonstrate that and show that. But those loves, they don't touch the highest thing. They don't touch that all-surpassing love that we are to have for God. That devotion to God is above all else. And if it ever came down to it, if it ever came down to, to following God or following this other direction, other people who, who just would not embrace the Lord, where is our devotion? We would have to forsake that, forsake our family, or whatever the case may be, that we would, that we would follow the Lord. He would be first. That's a hard word. That's a hard word, but that's what he's looking for. One more I'd like to share with you, and that's in Matthew 15, verse 8. Jesus, again speaking, he says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Again, Jesus being the, the great physician, he diagnoses their condition exactly. He says, you know what they come and, and before me? They're saying all the right things. They're singing the songs and they're honoring me with their, with their mouth, with their lips, their words. They're saying all the right stuff, but their hearts are far from me. He's, he's addressing, he's talking about religious people here. Now, let me ask you kind of a, a pointed question. Is this happening here today? That we could come into this place as the people of God 
and we could sing the songs and we could say the right things to each other and we could bless one another and yet our hearts be far from him is that happening here today can i tell you something absolutely absolutely guys here here's the honest truth we are a fickle bunch we're a fickle bunch one moment one moment we are so devoted to the Lord and oh, we, we go to the ends of the earth for the Lord. And the next minute, we're drawn aside by some crazy thought, you know, pulled aside. It's our struggle. It's, it's our humanness. I'm not saying it's okay, but it's, it's real, right? It's real. That's just true. We're always going to kind of be this mixed bag of motives. And, and there's always going to be this, this, this part of us that we, we want to serve God, but then we want this also. And that's just honest. That said, God is wanting to grow us in this area. God is wanting, wanting us to be genuine and true and authentic through and through. That it's not just about lip service. It's not just about saying the right things or singing the songs or putting on that outward appearance. Again, remember that we talked about a little while ago? But that's who we are at the core of our being. And He is doing this work in us. He is transforming us and conforming us into the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus. That's the work that He's doing. So Jesus here communicates to them this this stuff that's going on here. There's, there's another story that I think maybe kind of gives us a glimpse of this, kind of helps maybe to, uh, to understand it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put before you here the, uh, the story of Martha and Mary. Now, many of you are going to be familiar with the story. These are friends of Jesus. I'll just put it up here on the screen. Luke chapter 10, now it happened as they went that he, again Jesus, entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So here is Martha and Mary and their sisters. They've got a brother named Lazarus, by the way, that's not uh, mentioned here in this particular account, but they're sisters. And I want you to notice something, they are friends with Jesus they are friends with Jesus, and Martha has invited Jesus into her home, and Jesus has accepted this. He's, she's welcomed him into her house. That's a big deal, because you kind of know where this is going. You guys, you guys know where this story goes, and in, in many accounts, Martha almost gets vilified, okay? That's not where we're going with this. But she's welcomed him into her house, and, and she had a sister, Mary, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him, that being Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Martha is just, she's stressed out. She's distracted. Think about it. She's invited the king. She's invited the king of kings into her house. What would you be doing, right? What would you be doing? Jesus is, is in your house. You'd want everything to be clean. Oh, there's a sock on the floor. I'm going to get that out of here. I'm going to clean the dishes. I'm going to take the trash out. You would be distracted. Let's not vilify Martha, okay? She loves the Lord. She does. But she's distracted. She's distracted, and she goes to Jesus and says, you know, would you please get on to my sister here? Look at her. She's, she's sitting at your feet. She's being lazy right now. Would you tell her to help me? And no doubt she's expecting, she's thinking that Jesus is going to say, you know, Mary, you probably really should help your sister. But that's not what he does. Notice how he responds. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. I love this. Just the way that that's spoken, just the, the tone, just the, the gentle nature of Jesus communicating to Martha. Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. One thing is needed. Just one thing. All the other stuff, the trash getting taken out and all the other things... Don't worry about that. Just sit at my feet. Have time 
with me. And that's my encouragement for you this morning. I'm not saying you can neglect all the the stuff, all the, the busy work, all the things that you have going on in your house, but take time to sit at Jesus and just hear his words i love it mary's just sitting there and she's like she's just hanging on every word as jesus is just speaking over her communicating just the words of life to her what a beautiful picture beautiful picture it will not be taken away from her let's think about this for a moment why do we why would we move away from him He says that that you left your first love. Why why would that happen? How how could that even happen? Well, I want to give you a a simple thought. I I think that in in some ways it's because we lose the wonder. We forget who He is. We forget who Jesus is. We forget who God is. We forget just the, the greatness of His glory, and we lose the sense of awe and the sense of wonder. Do you realize how great God is? Do you not understand that that He fills the entire universe You could not go anywhere in the entire universe and escape His presence. He is huge, huge, glorious, and good, and mighty, and all-knowing. I mean, we could go on and on and on and just talk about the greatness of His glory. But here's the thing. We've heard it so much that we've become familiar with it. And what happens? We take it for granted. We begin to take it for granted. Guys, you have heard the story of the cross many times. Greatest story, right? That Jesus died for your sins, but you've heard it so much that it's, it's lost some of its magnificence, some of its splendor. It's like we, we lose some of that. We forget about it. It's like, oh yeah, the cross. I, of, course, of course the cross, yes. Yes, he died for my sins, yes. But we've heard it so many times that we're familiar with it that we've, it's like we've, we've lost our sense of awe and our sense of wonder about what God has done for us. Think about it in, in the sense of a marriage, right? For those of you who are married and uh, maybe think back to the time you were newlyweds, man, you could, not, you could not be apart for more than any time at all. You're on the phone, you know. You hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> And everybody around you is just like, oh, you're so in love. You're so in love. (laughs) But then think about it. For those of you who've been married 30, 40, 50 years, it is really rare. Guys, it's really rare to find a couple with that same kind of fervent love. Doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, that's God's plan. That's God's design. So, so shoot for that. By, by all means, let's shoot to have marriages like that. But what happens is, is, is you begin to take each other for granted, right? And little by little on the couch, it's like he's, she's sitting over there and you're kind of scooting over little by little. And, and pretty soon you've left. There's distance. And it's because you've taken each other for granted. And we do the same thing. That which is so wonderful loses its wonder. And I, I, I just I believe, I know, His word for us today is He is calling us back. He is calling us back to love Him with all that we are and to embrace and just see the wonder of our Lord. Well, He gives them a remedy. He's, he's given them a diagnosis, right? You've, you've left your first love. This is a big deal. Now He gives them a remedy. And He tells them three things that they need to focus on. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. And now notice with me, verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He gives them really three things here. He says, remember. I want you to remember from where you've fallen. I want you to remember just the heights, the the place that, that... Uh, that time when you just walked with Him in newness of life and you were just so excited to serve the Lord. I want you to remember that. And then I want you to repent. Do a U-turn. Turn back. Let's Let's return to Him. Turn back to Him. And then He says, do the first works. Repeat. So think of it in three three simple words. Remember, repent, and repeat. I want you to to turn back to, to me, He says. That's what He's calling us to do. He gives us a simple remedy there. 
Notice this, middle of verse 5. It says, repent and do the first works or else. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I see that little phrase right there, or else, and that's kind of ominous, right? Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He says, unless you repent, I'm going to, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Now that is a troubling thing. What is he? Well, remember what Jesus told us that we are. Remember in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world, this lampstand. We're the light of the world. We're to be making an impact into this world. We're the salt of the earth. We're to be making impact into our world around us. And he's saying, you're going to lose that. You're going to lose your reach. You're going to lose your impact into this world. That's, that's, that's a very scary thing. He kind of gives them this thought, or else. This, this is going to happen. That's a sobering thought. But let me, let me ask you this. What would happen if today we went back and we visited Ephesus? What would we find in Ephesus? We'd find a lot of artifacts. We'd find a lot of history. We would not find a thriving church. They lost their lampstand in some ways. Now, I'm not saying there are not believers there. I'm not saying that there are not believers. I believe that there are believers in every nook and cranny on the earth. But that thriving church that was so busy and so commended by Jesus for their works, their toiling and their labor, we're not going to go to Ephesus today and find that. And the same can be said about other movements throughout church history. Think about the Welsh revivals, the revivals in Wales. Some of you are you're familiar with that great move of God that happened there. Today, a, a tiny remnant of it. What about England? What about Charles Spurgeon speaking there in London to 5,000 people without a microphone? That church today is a shell of what it once was. And now let's think about Roswell. What if the Lord tarries? What if he doesn't come back in in the next 50 or 100 years? What will the church in Roswell look like? Will will we still have a thriving church? And and I say that not even sure that that's where we are right now, but will we have a church that's extending and reaching into our community? Will we have believers who are alive in the Spirit and, and just of zeal for the Lord? I don't know. He gives us, again, just kind of a warning, something to take to heart. <clears throat> but the key is repentance. If we don't repent, if we don't turn back to things, we're going to find ourselves with our lampstand being removed and our influence taken away. Now look with me at verse 6. Here we're introduced to a group of people called the Nicolaitans. He says in verse 6, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Who are the Nicolaitans? Well, that's a, that's a good question. We don't really know. Lots have been written throughout the, uh, the centuries. Lots of people have commented on it, have written things on it. But the Bible just doesn't give us a whole lot of insight into who these people are. But it's funny. It's interesting where this shows up in the letter. He gives, he gives them the commendation, then he gives them the diagnosis about the things that are wrong, the remedy and how to repair that, and then at the end of that, he gives us this thought about the Nicolaitans, and it just seems almost out of place. Why wasn't this mentioned earlier? But I, I believe this is important, so here, if we just try to look at this very simply, I believe we can, we can gain some clues here and see what this is talking about. The term Nicolaitan, in the Greek, it means power over the people, power over the people, or victor over the people. You could even say conqueror over the people. And many Bible scholars believe that what was happening here is a group had, was seeking to infiltrate the church and establish kind of this, uh, this class, if you will, of clergy who would lord it over the laity. Now, the laity, that's the people, that's the congregation, right? Jesus said, I don't ever want you to do that, by the way. That's not, how, that's not how we do things. But that's what this group was seeking to do. They were seeking to gain this place where they could control the people of God. And it has happened throughout church history again and again. A little more study. Don't have time to get into it. 
reveals that, that perhaps it was for money. That they found that they could control the people and manipulate the people so that they would give more. So that they could fill their pockets. And I simply want to say, don't be controlled. Don't be manipulated. Don't be exploited. Jesus says, I hate that. The Ephesian church, they had that going for them because they weren't allowing it there. They hated it, and Jesus says, I hate it as well. Now, why is this here? Why, why is the, the flow, what's the flow of thought here? Well, let me give it to you, what I, I believe he's saying. Simply this, that God wants us to serve Him out of pure love and devotion for Him. He does not want us to serve Him because we've been guilted into it. He doesn't want you to serve uh, Him because you've been manipulated. He doesn't want you to give and put your, your offering in the box back there because some feel bad and told you that if you don't give, that there's going to be a curse on your life or, or even worse, to tell you that uh, if you do give, God's going to make you rich. That is abuse, folks. That is abuse. And God hates it. God wants you to, to, to give because you love Him. God wants you to serve because you love Him. God wants you to, to give of your time, not because somebody's controlling you and moving you around and manipulating you, but because you just want to serve God and you are willing to pour out your life for Him because you love Him. That's what He's looking for. Well, they had that going for them. They didn't, they didn't give the Nicolaitans place. God says, I hate that. And if you're ever in a situation or in a church where you are being abused like that, leave we have no king but jesus jesus is our king jesus is our lord we don't need anybody else to lord it over us right not a pastor not a governing body not a board of elders not a deacon board none of that jesus is our lord amen well let's close this thing out now and uh, look with me at the end of it here verse 7 he says he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He who has an ear to hear, that's my prayer, is that today that God would speak to us. Have you heard him speak to you today? Is there anything he's communicated to you? Let's take those things and let's give ear to them. Let's take those things that he, he talks to us about. Anytime we open his word, any, anytime he communicates truth to us, and let's seek to apply those things. And then he says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He's calling us to overcome in this area. Now think about this. What is an overcomer? We might think, well, an overcomer, that's like a super Christian, right? That's like somebody who's like, you know, really, really on fire for the Lord and just you know, almost like a superhero kind of thing. And I want to say, no, if you are a believer, you're an overcomer. Let me tell you why. Here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If you have been born of God, if you have been born again, guess what? You're an overcomer. You have the ability to walk in His strength. He's going to give you that strength and, and enable you to overcome. Remember, in his, in his strong right hand, He's upholding the church. He's going to give you the ability to overcome in these areas that we're struggling in. Think of how it says it in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. This whole section in Romans is great, by the way. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Have you ever thought of yourself that way? That through Him, through His strength, not our strength, through His strength, we are more than conquerors. You are more than conquerors. Let that sink in. And the next time that you're facing a, a struggle or a crisis, remember that. Through Him, I am more than a conqueror. I can overcome. We can overcome. We can have victory. Well, the person that does that, the person that does overcome, He gives the right. He gives them the, the ability to eat from the tree of life. Last part of verse 7. The tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You guys remember the story from Genesis, right? The book of Genesis. They, they fell into sin. Adam and Eve, they were kicked out of the garden. God says, I'm going to give you access to that. Because our sins are washed away. 
because of what He's done in us. He's making us overcomers and He's giving us opportunity. He's bringing us into that, that place where we can eat from the tree of life. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us here in just a moment. And I just want you to take a, a minute. I'm going to start us in prayer. And I just want to say this. If, if He has spoken in any way, to him who has ears to hear, let him hear. I just want to give you a moment to process anything that the Lord would say to you. And then we will uh, come back and close with the final song of worship. Father, we come before you and I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your accurate diagnosis in our lives. You know exactly those areas that, that we need to deal with. And I pray that right now in the quietness of this moment, Lord, that you would bring those things to mind. You show us those things that, that are not of you. And with that, Lord, that you would empower us. Just your right hand of strength, Lord, that you would give us the ability to overcome. Take just a moment. Lord, you know us. You know our works. You see right through us, Lord. There's no way that we could ever deceive you or put on appearances. And, and Lord, I just, I'm so glad that you see us, warts and all, and yet, Lord, you love us. You love us. You love your people here today, and I pray that that would just be known by them, that they would just sense and know that you love them. And now, Lord, I'm asking that because you first loved us, that you would help us to love you with every, every fiber of our being, Lord, that we would love you. That it would be the highest love of our lives and it would, it would surpass any other thing in this life. Draw us to that, Lord. Help us to return to you. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll close in a final song of worship. If any of you need prayer, I'll be up front here following the service. Uh, but now let's turn our thoughts and minds to him in, pr in uh, praise and worship.